from the heart of Central Florida, you're listening to the most electrifying show in media. A Neighbor's Choice. I'm your host, your neighbor, David Gronoski. So glad to be with you again for another journey through the news of our time. We are live on FM and AM across Central Florida. We're soaring high around the airwaves, and we're worldwide on neighborschoice.com. Happy to have you and I and our guest now, who is an editor at the Mises Institute. He is someone who is our North Florida uh, panhandle correspondent, Tho Bishop. How are you, Tho? Hello, David. Always glad to join you. Uh, great having you, as always. And I, I wanted to get your... Uh, take on the big story going on right now. Hillary Clinton announces she's innocent. She didn't do nothing. What do you think of that? Right. Yeah, no, it, it, the election was stolen from her, and it's, it's all a Putin plot, and uh, she, she should be president right now if not for these uh, dastardly deplorables and uh, James Comey and all this conspiracy of lies built to take take her down. Um, it, it's, it's interesting. She, she can't avoid... On the news cycle, I, I, I know uh, uh, Jeff Dice has commented uh, uh, frequently that uh, uh, he, he thinks that she is preparing a, a second run uh, come 2024. I, I, I think that's exactly what the Democrats deserve at this point. Uh, but it's interesting. Some people just cannot retire gracefully, and I think Madam Clinton is one of those sort of, uh, such people. I thought she was preparing to announce that she was creating a, a, a girls' retreat at uh, Epstein's Island. She's going to open it up and have a place for people to come and get therapy and everything else for all the trauma that she's uh, uh, protecting them from. You think some Clinton funds there uh, with with the charity? Yeah, you know, they got enough funds from Haiti alone. They've got plenty to give around to a new charity, don't you think? I, I think so. They, they know how to run that. They, they got a great, great email list, that's for sure. Uh, you shared an article from the great uh, art, uh, writer Jeff Deist, Inflation, state-sponsored terrorism. How is inflation state-sponsored terror? That's an interesting angle at the Mises Institute. Well, I think one of the aspects, and I think this is all you know, something we've all gained experience this past year, unfortunately, it's, it's the uncertainty that comes with inflation that is something that you can't simply measure kind of in pure sort of economic terms, right? You know, when you have business owners that don't know you know, what the future is going to lie for their the, the prices of their supplies and goods. They don't, they don't know how to price things in the future. Uh, American savings and, and how well those can hold up um, through everything going on now. And I understand, you know, Biden will brag about, uh, you know, the, 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 the decrease in gas prices uh, from, from the record highs, uh, the historical highs that we, we saw earlier this year. I think a lot of that has to do with uh, – and. The, rating of the strategic reserves and, and some other dynamics like that. But this, this inflationary issue that is, is really a global force, I mean, it, this is what destroys civilizations itself. It, it, is, it is an act by the state uh, that fundamentally undermines the ability for civil society um, to, to function properly with any sort of, of confidence. And, you know, I, I think we, we have to understand that, again, like these sort of economic issues, they are not they, – they, they're not – simply relegated to what we normally consider as economic analysis. I mean, these are, these are cultural, structural, societal issues um, that must be taken seriously and must be called out, I think, in the, the most stark terms possible. You know, the, the left does that. You know, the, the left is able to, to, to wrap up their economic crusades you know, with, with a sort of moral vigor uh, that, that often you know, supply fighters lack, and I, I think that's exactly where Jeff is trying to do with with that article, and I think that's the approach um, that I, I think is necessary if we're going to kind of restore uh, the civil society that uh, the American civilization and really the rest of the world desperately needs uh, restored right now. So when you see, uh, by the way, I wanted to get your take on kind of the fallout. I don't think I had you, I don't think we've done a show since the uh, last election there, the um, midterm uh, midterm uh, primary election and uh, our, our uh a mutual friend, Anthony Sabatini, lost his primary. What, what is your general general overall take from that night and uh, particularly the Sabatini turnout, uh, what happened? Well, I, I think in Florida it's, it's an interesting dynamic where con contentness 
breeds apathy. And I, I think that's one of the things you saw throughout the state was very low turnouts in primaries, you know, down in, in Central Florida. I know that's certainly true up here in the Panhandle. And I, I think that's kind of one of the interesting paradoxes in, in living in a state like Florida, where there's so much confidence in Ron DeSantis that it is very difficult to get that you know that the sort of uh, that, that you know that 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 Trump voter, right? That that, that first time voter that that finally felt politics mattered to them, you know, in 2016 and 2020, and and I, I think ultimately, you know, this is kind of I, I think it's a, it's a very important lesson for the future of the Republican Party generally, right? Where if if you only have historic Republican voters voting in primaries, then the future of the Republican Party is not going to be dictated by this sort of populist movement that Trump has inspired, but is instead going to be uh, largely controlled by the same sorts of people that gave us Mitt Romney in 2012. And so how you are able to capture Trump energy when he's not on the ballot, I think, is one of the important challenges that faces, you know, let's call it the American first, you know, sort of movement on the right generally. And and some states have been better than others. I I think Senate races you know, the, the races that are very prominent on, on Fox News, Senate races and gov- gubernatorial races, those tend to attract a lot more attention, understandably so, uh, than congressional races or state house races. Um, but that's something that, yeah, that, that that's where, again, if, if, if the Trump wing of the Republican Party really wants to take over the party, it, it must get the rank and file out to vote in elections. They norm, people normally don't vote. That's, that's a big challenge. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see how that turns out um, over the next couple cycles. But I, I think that, you know, if, if people do not, if, if people in Florida are very confident about where Florida is. And so I, I think that itself kind of fuels turnout and primary races. I don't think it's going to be an issue in November. I don't think that that means, you know, Governor DeSantis has to look over his shoulder at an increase in Democratic enthusiasm. Right. I, I think November will be fine. Um, but those August primaries are in many ways uh, more important, particularly in very red, uh, red parts of the state. Yeah, well, that it, um, it's disappointing that people still don't know what time it is and they don't want to have anybody actually represent them who actually fought for liberty. Sabatini was, regardless of whatever you disagree with him on other things, when it comes to the most important issue that we've had, which is the uh, pandemic assault and all the corruption that took place with that and the abuse and the violence uh, from our government at every level. Uh, and, and and Sabatini was out there before DeSantis, um, uh, when DeSantis was still on the herd of fear. Uh, he was out there, out there, uh, you know, representing people pro bono, getting people out of prison. So he was doing the actual good work before it was cool. And the fact that, you know, the, 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 the electorate is is apathetic enough to not see that is, is kind of disturbing. Um, I do think that the pandemic well, issue is, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's probably, we're, we're always dealing with short attention spans. And again, I, you know, it, it's understandable. Short attention right? North, span. North they people. just had a mass, they just had a mass pandemic, millions of people dying that didn't need to die. And there's the American tension span. Oh, what's, uh, what else is on TV, honey? I can barely breathe after all that. Right. You know? Yeah, and that is the problem. The, 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 a lot of the people, I mean, you know, it, it, there's a large section of the population that, you know, they don't want to be political animals, right? You know, they, they don't want to be engaged. You know, they, they don't want to, to wrap their lives around news cycles and things like that. You know, they don't want to be watching. Uh, you know, they don't, you know, they, 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 you know they, they want to kind of be able to tune it all out. And the problem is that tuning it all out is how you get a bunch of swamp creatures controlling your life through, you know, an imperial capitalist an imperial capital in D.C. And, and unfortunately, until you know, that that sinks in, those lessons are learned. Um, it, it, it's very difficult to change the just just the, the you know, so much power um, that is predicated on trying to maintain the status quo, even if people you know wave signs and and, and bumper stickers that try to subvert um, you know MAGA or whatever. Um, you know, it takes a lot more to kind of understand who the, tr- who, the who the true champions are and who the fakes are. And again, it's, it's, it's a difficult problem to solve. So when you look at, uh, for example, I, I, I just talked to Dr. Peter McCullough, who was an early uh, treatment doctor for COVID, um, has become a worldwide figure for liberty and, and scientific uh, rigor in the COVID pandemic. 
And him and I, we were both talking about how nobody hardly, except for just a few people, DeSantis, Carrie Lake, and he mentioned a, another figure, um, you know, then you got Ron Johnson and Rand Paul, but you really have, like, nobody's really making uh, the pandemic a topic of great importance in their campaigns. And uh, you're seeing people talk about the border and all these other things, but I don't think they capture how egregious the whole thing was. Uh, on my program, we get probably the most interest is still on our pandemic topics when we interview people about the pandemic and COVID, even after this time. And a lot of people want a reckoning to be there for the people who lied us into this, who criminally denied people early treatment. Millions of people died that didn't need to die. We still don't have an accountable understanding of the origin of it. We still don't have uh, laws in place to stop these lockdowns and uh, lies about masks and going to funerals and weddings and people in Tampa Bay being arrested because their neighbor ratted on them for having outdoor wrestling matches in their front yard. I mean, th this kind of stupidity was never quite dealt with, and it, it's almost like it was so traumatic that people don't want to talk about it. You know, it's like they just want to turn the page and they don't want to deal with the elephant in the room. Well, I think one of the problems is that you have a lot of Republicans with their fingerprints on it. And, you know, I, I think that when we, when we think about American politics and we think about, um, you know, the swamp, I mean, it's, it's the, the language that is best kind of used to capture it is, is the uniparty, right? Like you, you have I mean, for, for the, you know, since the 20th century, we've had essentially Republicans and Democrats working hand in hand on the biggest issues that have built up this administrative state that we have in Washington. Both sides are called, or, you know, both sides are, are, are responsible for it. You know, they, 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 they pick little culture war issues on the side to yell at each other during Sunday talk shows, but, you know, they live in D.C. together, they socialize together, they walk across the aisle. You know, we're starting to see a little bit of a pivot of that. There's a few members of Congress that probably do not have many Democrat friends. I think Matt Gates up here in Pensacola is, is a great example of that. Um, you know, and Marjorie Taylor Greene, the, the Thomas Masters of the world, right? They're not up there to get along and get along with, with their Democratic colleagues. I mean, they're there to, to champion their constituents. And unfortunately, there's a lot of Republic, there are a lot of Republican governors, there's a lot of Republican, I mean, e e even Donald Trump, um, you know, through, through Operation Warp Speed and, and the role that his administration played and, and uh, you know, funneling, you know, an ungodly amount of money to these pharmaceutical companies without liability, you know, that, that's, that, that there's still a lot of Republicans that are afraid of taking on an issue when they have some blame there. And again, like that's why until you get, you know, until you get enough of an uprising to actually change who represents, who makes up the Republican Party in power, um, you know, not just increasing the voter rolls in the state, but actually changing what the makeup, the ideological makeup of the Senate, of the House, um, you know, the leadership positions, right, until you get those structural changes up top, then Washington is going to be, continue to be a, a losing game. It doesn't matter who is who, who wins the presidency. Uh, one of the things I think is interesting, though, right now is that uh, uh, another Florida man, uh, Rick Scott, he's now starting to throw some punches publicly against Mitch McConnell. I, I'm, I'm not going to try to sell Rick Scott as being some sort of, of, of mega warrior, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene figure in, in the Senate by any means. I mean, he's certainly not that. Um, but that's someone who has the financial resources, who has um, the ambition to perhaps challenge Mitch McConnell for the Senate Majority Leader position, um, which I think would create a very interesting dynamic with some of these inter-party discussions going on in Washington. Um, but again, until you change the leadership, until you change again, who actually represents the Republican Party in power, um, and the, the unit party is going to continue to thrive, regardless of the outrage that we have as citizens about, you know, what's going on with the Biden administration, what, what the Fauci regime did to us, um, you know, all these, you know, the, the, the evils um, that our taxpayers have, you know, our tax dollars have gone to fund. That will not change by our anger alone. It must come from structure, from, from actually removing um, these people that refuse to stand up for us up there in Washington. Why is uh, uh, Senator Rick Scott so establishment when he's uh, independently wealthy and doesn't need the money? Well, it's interesting that the, the, what what the, the definition of an establishment is, I think, can get murky sometimes. Uh, Rick Scott is someone who, ideologically, I, I don't think that he's a firebrand. I think that he, you know, I, I think you, you could call Rick Scott a kind of a pragmatic Republican, and I don't mean that as, a, as kind of a, a slur there. I, I think he's someone who is not 
you know, he, he doesn't have fire in his belly per se. You know, he he's, he's he doesn't have, you know, he, he's not someone in the game of, of broad ideological uh, change within the Republican Party. Um, he he has he is someone though that when he was governor of Florida, he essentially created his own parallel um, political system um, outside of the Republican Party of Florida that he would use to attack Republicans that were not following his agenda. Now, I didn't always like what his agenda was, so you know that that's that's that other side of it, but. He, he was someone who has never been unwilling to step on toes with his own party if he thought that he could do the job better. And I think what you're seeing from Rick Scott right now is that, again, he is not someone up there that I, I think wants to jail Fauci. Um, but I do think that he is frustrated on the unwillingness of the Republican Party to be serious about certain economic issues. Um, I, I think, you know, I, I think that he, you know, some of the, the more talking points of, of let's call it the, the old conservative uh, establishment right you know the, 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 the sort of the heritage foundation style of Republican Party which again I don't think is sufficient for the current environment but someone who takes that stuff seriously rather than not is it w- would be would represent some sort of change up there and so I I, I think Rick Scott is you know, he, he is he is not necessarily a, a a firebrand conservative by any means but I do think that he is willing to take on certain establishment figures if he thinks that he can do the job better than they are doing right now. And I, I think that's dynamic where, you know, unfortunately, when it comes to, to you know, federal politics, money, resources, and, and the ambition to go after figures that have been in D.C. for decades, you know, there, there's not a lot of those people out there. You know, someone like a Matt Gates would probably have a hard time getting elected Speaker of the House. Um, but I, I think a Rick Scott is someone who can finan- who's, who's financially assisting people like Blake Masters and J.D. Vance and some of these campaigns that Mitch McConnell was not happy with those primary outcomes. I think that has the opportunity of creating a very co- interesting coalition. And if, if Blake Masters, um, who's someone I, I think you and I both are, are fans of, if Blake Masters prefers a Rick Scott over a Mitch McConnell, I think that makes Rick Scott far more interesting as a theoretical Senate majority leader in spite of his own ideological failings. Yeah, there's... Um... How, how is the change of guard of a Senate majority or minority leader determined? It's going to be a, a come up to a vote by the members of the of the Republican caucus. But I mean, how is it really determined? Midterms. But how is it determined? A, a, a before big part that of it's financing. It's a, a, a big part of it is financing. You know, who is the who, biggest who, who, fundraiser? Who has, is that what it is? Who is the best right. at fundraising for corporate interests yep. and stuff? And, and, or or and, and yeah, so it, you know who who was the who was the person that came in and flooded your campaign with a bunch of money? This is particularly true for the Senate side of things, um, because the Senate races are statewide; they're they're extremely expensive. Mitch McConnell's biggest weapon has been his financial capacity to help campaigns, um, and particularly in those competitive purple state sort of districts where you know these are going to be massive massive funded campaigns throughout you know, a state the size of Arizona or Texas or whatever. Um, the House, we've, we've seen more um, more willingness at the House um, for, you know, like, you know, John Boehner lost his speakership because he lost the confidence of the caucus. Um, that's what led to Paul Ryan's speakership, right? Um, so the House can be motivated a little bit more by ideology, particularly if you have constituents organized. I mean, conservative talk radio played a big role in the, in the downfall of John Boehner. Um, so the House is where you can have a little more flexibility uh, because you, you, you're dealing with a lot more um, like solid red districts there, so solid red districts make up a much broader part of that caucus. Um, there, you just have you, you know the question there is: Do you have someone willing to stand up, willing to organize and lead those sort of organizations, or that, that organizational effort to try to overthrow the king? Right? You know, is there a large enough caucus of the Republicans of the courage to suffer the wrath of Kevin McCarthy? Um, because like any good coup. If you're on the losing side of the coup, there are consequences. And there's a lot of House members that they don't want to risk being backbenched on committees that they think are important for their constituency needs, right? And if you go against the king and you don't take down the king, then you're doing damage to your career. And so that's why you need a lot more ideological firebrand sort of figures within the House that care more about a cause than they are relationships in D.C., the Senate, it's a little bit more difficult as a smaller group there. Um, but again, if, if, if Rick's – the good side of it is that really all you need is a you, – you don't need to win the majority of the Republican caucus. If you have, let's say, there's a 
Republican Democrat advantage um, after the, 2012, the 2022 elections, right? You don't need to win over you know, 20, you know, 28 Republican senators. All you really need is four or five Republican senators that say, we will not, we, you know, I don't care how much you whip us, we will not support Mitch McConnell. And if you get those five held outs, then Mitch McConnell cannot get the votes that he needs for that position. And that opens up the table. Then who, who is the candidate that can bridge that gap? And so that's what we need to start seeing is minority of Republicans leveraging those sort of margins to force the sort of institutional changes that these bodies desperately need. So uh, there's a story like in Bloomberg about uh, today about this uh, Republicans have a Peter Thiel problem because he put $15 million into Blake Masters and $15 million into J.D. Vance, and they won the Republican primaries with Trump's endorsement, and they're supposedly floundering in the general election polls. And Blake Masters, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Mitch McConnell is saying to, to Teal, he needs to pony up more money to protect these candidates from losing uh, before he helps them with his Senate, win, uh, Senate money fund. So what's your take on this whole dynamic? Right. This is Mitch McConnell you're throwing a temper tantrum because he didn't get his way in these primaries. Um, you know, this is going to be, a, I think, a constant source of tension, right? Peter Thiel is interjecting himself as a new sort of power broker within the Republican Party. It's not the same sort of, you know, Coke money, uh, you know, Sheldon Adelson money, right? The same sort of, of oligarchs um, that were able to kind of dictate Republican politics for, you know, 10, 12 years prior to um, that Mitch McConnell was able to get along quite well with. Um, Peter Thiel is someone with a very different agenda and someone that uh, Mitch McConnell does not like. And so I, I think that – yeah, I, I think Mitch McConnell would be perfectly fine with the Blake Masters losing so long as he can kind of solidify his wins elsewhere um, to, to keep someone like a Blake Masters out of the Senate. And so that's where someone like Rick Scott that has his own fund um, – you know, he's head of the Republican um, – you know, one of the large Republican Senate senatorial PACs. Um, that's where I, I think Rick Scott is playing his way in there – that if, if Mitch McConnell's not going to do the job, Rick Scott's going to come in and do it. And this is where again, it's, it's leading to some public uh, back and forth, you know, some, some public criticism by Rick Scott of Mitch McConnell. And that's, that's, that's something that's very interesting. That's something that, that we have not seen really Mitch McConnell face at this sort of scale um, throughout his career. And that's where, again, I, I think that the polling at this point um, showing weaknesses for these candidates Again, I think J.D. Vance can have no problem at all. Um, Arizona is, you know, it, it's an interesting state in its own right. I think at the end of the day, you, you can't trust polls at this point uh, to any great extent. Um, and I, I, think, I think that, you know, as time goes on, I, I think the Blake Masters race, we're already seeing tightening. Um, the consequence of Biden's rhetoric um, of late has been that it's, it's, it's helped uh, improve his own approval ratings a certain bit um, because Democrats are coming home, but it's turning off a lot of independents. And so I, I think a lot of this is concerned about nothing, but it's interesting to see the consequence of this going forward. Well, very good, though. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks for your thoughts and comments. I always enjoy it, And check out Mises.org, M-I-S-E-S dot org, for more of Phil Bishop's work, as well as other articles about the economy there, Mises.org, M-I-S-E-S dot org. You can also follow, though, at Phil Bishop on Twitter. We'll be right back after this short break.
Janoski here. You're listening to A Neighbor's Choice Radio. Hope you're doing well. You can call in at 727-587-1040. That's 727-587-1040. If you'd like to join in the discussion with your thoughts or comments on any of the news of the day or any of the ideas that we've explored thus far in this broadcast, we've had Tho Bishop on. We've had uh, we've had uh, Pro- uh, Professor Wilfred Riley. Uh, we've had Reverend Jim Fitzgerald. Uh, I've interviewed today, and you'll see it soon. Um, uh, my newest episode of The Science, which is my series on the science of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, is with Dr. Peter McCullough, the world's, one of the best world uh, leader on this topic, uh, and he's done a fantastic job getting the ideas of the truth, the scientific facts out there. He joined me again on the science. So you're going to want to look forward to that. Speaking of COVID, Alex Brinson says, vaccination, it's a religious experience on his Substack, The collapse of demand for the mRNA COVID shot seems to have driven some vaccine fanatics around the bend. Today, Dr. Ashish Jha the White House COVID coordinator embraced creationism. He said, I really believe this is why God gave us two arms, one for the flu shot and another for the COVID shot, which raises the question, why didn't he give us three arms? What happens if Moderna can somehow jam an RSV jab through the FDA? So, you know, that's what we can expect from this garbage uh, administration, which is so disgustingly sold out to soulless corporations and scientism in its perversion of science. New York Governor uh, Hochul says Christian worshipers, tells Christian worshipers God wants you to be vaccinated. That's a headline from last year. Uh, So these people are uh, absolutely uh, repulsive in their language, but this is what they worship. They reveal their true religiosity uh, in their promotion of shameless, profiteering, obscene, corporatism. It's absolutely disgusting. And then that Joe Biden clown, that joke of a guy has to go on and say, oh, did you see me? I took on Big Pharma. I mean, what, these guys are shameless psychopaths, you know. These guys are, you know, you know, they could pour a cup of water on you and tell you, you're pouring water on me. I mean, this is how psychopathic these people are insane, you know. I mean, they literally deny reality over and over and over again. The know-nothing party is truly what these folks are all about. Know-nothing, do-nothing, bigots. The only thing they do is start wars based on lies. They pillage people. They pillage the poor and the middle class. And I don't think I've commented on that dumb uh, Biden speech where the little millennial staffers that he had that saw the dark Brandon meme where they were trying to look all edgy like V for Vendetta or something. They said, hey, let's make a blood red background on the Declaration of Independence. And then let's have the president come out and tell people that if you vote for his oppositional movement, if you vote against his, op, you know, vote for uh, your his opposition, that you are an extremist, that there's something wrong with you. I mean, these people are living in a in a in a streaming garbage sea level show. Uh, where the writing is garbage, and they try to play act it, play act it out in LARP it, live action role play it out, and it doesn't work. You know these people are jokes, um, but that's why you've got people like you know the actress Jennifer Lawrence. She says that she has recurring nightmares about Tucker Carlson, um, and I mean they just, I mean she, I guess she sees him like a David Lynch movie, just ooh, you know, boom, showing up in her. A room or something like Freddy Krueger, and he's probably doing that laugh he does, ah, you know that laugh he does, really, ah, you know, he's doing that, and he's and she just sees that on repeat over and over and over again. These people are living in a fantasy, you know. They're desperate to be a part of something special. They're desperate to not just le- live these vapid lives that they live, right, where they don't get anything of meaning. They're not doing anything of real importance other than just, you know. Uh, living in a very decadent imperial uh, context. And so that's why these people, they need the fantasy. They need the suspension of disbelief. They need to live in the movie, right? They don't want to live outside of the movie script that they've built for themselves in in their minds, right? They can't live outside of that uh, uh, script. But in the real world, 
the people who sponsor their little fantasies, their political narratives, their little dark brand and stupid theatrics, they're making money all the way to the bank. Public Health.News says Pfizer to make record $54 billion from COVID shots and treatment, okay? So that's where, you know, brought to you by, that's where the money's being made for all these little fantasies that people live in. Uh, and that's obscene because, you know, how many millions of people had to die for Pfizer to make those billions? You know, that's what it really means when you say they're making a killing. I mean, they're literally making a killing here because they are promoting disinformation about life-saving, inexpensive public domain products so that everybody can be funneled into these patented, obscene, profiteering products that have failed miserably. And Trump is dooming his political legacy the more he doubles down on backing these garbage products. They're failed products. They're trash. They're dangerous. Many people are being very violently harmed by these products. And anybody who's telling you that this thing is effective is a crook or an idiot, an imbecile that hates science at this point because the scientific facts are undeniable. The lockdowns were disastrous. They were a disastrous fascist attack on our society. The mask mandates were a fascist attack on children and their health, and people are even being stunted in their development. Uh, children are being stunted still from that effect of that trauma of the masks. This garbage has to be reckoned with, and it hasn't gotten a proper reckoning thus far. And you have to wonder why. Do you think it's because Republicans are just controlled by Big Pharma? Do you think it's because Republicans are just scared? They're, they know that the public health institutions in D.C. have one position and they don't want to rock the boat? Why do you think that is? When I asked that question to Ron DeSantis, will you do criminal investigations of Pfizer, it was interesting that the Attorney General, Ashley Moody, kind of stepped in and said, I don't think you meant criminal. I think you mean like civil. That's something we may have to look in. But I said, no, 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 I meant criminal. I mean, that's the thing. You know, the Republican establishment's always, oh, I don't think you want to go criminal against Pfizer, right? They didn't do anything criminal. No, 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 no. There is wanton uh, evidence that they did their proper due diligence in telling us the truth about these protons. They are, there's, there's not a lot of evidence that they have done their proper work. What I have seen is a lot of la uh, fast and loose with the facts. That's what I've seen from the big pharma people. I've seen a lot of people playing fast and loose with the truth. And it has harmed many people who are gullibly going to do whatever an authority figure that they perceive to be credible tells them to do without even thinking about what they're doing. Meanwhile, statnews.com says Pfizer isn't sharing COVID vaccines with researchers for next generation studies. This is by Rachel Kors. Uh, so they, Pfizer and Moderna hold the patents for the current vaccines. Researchers would likely have to get the company's permission to use them for research into products like nasal or pan-coronavirus vaccines. Right now, Pfizer isn't sharing its vaccines for research purposes. Uh, Moderna didn't comment when we asked. Pfizer's stance is legal and is in line with the company's commercial interests. Uh, Anna Santos Rushman, a professor of law at Villanova University, says... So, you know, these people are going to continue to hold on to their patents. That's why I think we need to abolish patents in medicine, get rid of the whole corruption of the whole thing so that every drug and product, whether it's long, long on the market or a generic drug, something that has been expired in terms of its patent, everything should get a fair shot at getting research and, and uh, funding towards it to see what actually works, not having this stacked deck where there's always going to be a monetary incentive to funnel funds into new products that come with a patent so that you can have the obscene profit margins. That's not a true market. Patents on medicine is not a product of markets. It's a product of government coercion and government imposition into the market. It's not something that's actually natural to a market. Uh, so that's interesting uh, that uh, people continue to just say, hey, Oh, these products, nothing to see here. No, people are being injured left and right, and that we do need to know what's going on with those products. There needs to be investigations. There needs to be, as I think the state of New York, if they can investigate the Trump Organization's chief financial officer for how much money he, he didn't report for a car or something. How in the hell can we not have somebody with the guts in some state like Florida 
that leads the way and impanels an investigation to find out what criminal fraud may have been perpetrated by Moderna and Pfizer, or are we asking too much of our public servants? I don't know. You tell me. With all these injuries people have, blood clots to the brain from Johnson & Johnson, uh, problems with fertility, injuries left and right, a panoply of diseases bursting out of people, myocarditis, even Ron DeSantis mentioned that in his uh, administration. So we have got to get this conversation properly explored. This is the one of the biggest, if not the biggest issue. More people died in this pandemic if you count the people who died from the gain-of-function Wuhan virus that Fauci and others funded uh, that unleashed all over the world. Uh, more people, if you count those deaths and the deaths of people from the uh, denial of early treatment, from the vaccine injuries and, and uh, deaths, more people have died than any other war, than any war in history. And yet we're supposed to yawn and talk about, oh, let's talk about the, the Mar-a-Lago raid. No, this is more important. Okay? Visuals of the, it's the, the Mar-a-Lago raid is, 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 is bad. They shouldn't do that. But this is more important. Okay? And if, if Trump needs to get on board with the truth, if he wants to be the true change agent that he pretends that he says he is. I mean, if you're really going to change things, then tell the truth. Don't be so. A true leader knows when they're wrong. And that's the problem with his cartoonish persona. He doesn't able to, able to correct and say, you know what, I got duped. Maybe he can still do it. We'll see. I'm not holding out much hope for that. Breitbart says CNN employees freaked out over recent exit under new boss Chris Like. Is there a purge going on, they ask. People are freaked out. It's almost like there's a pattern. An anonymous CNN journalist told the Washington Post they seem to be sending a mission. A message, watch what you say, watch what you do. So these little cancelers are getting canceled left and right because their garbage product is in the toilet. Nobody watches it. Nobody cares. It's filled with hate and disinformation and bigotry and no nothingism. Nobody likes that crap. We're sick and tired of that. We want to have content that's full of energy and passion and truth and diversity of thought and thinking for ourselves and empowering us. We don't want to be told by these uh, fools that, you know, everything is, 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 you know, a lie and everything good is bad and everything bad is good. That's garbage. We don't want that nihilism. And I think people are rejecting it. So these people are now facing the consequences of the market saying we've had enough. Somebody comes in and says, hey, let's clean up the product. And they're terrified that these losers who've been spewing their hate for so long now might have to actually get out and uh, face the music of nobody caring for their garbage. So uh, another story I wanted to get to real quick, CNBC says millennials and Gen Zers do want to buy homes, but they just can't afford it, even as adults. And so you're continuing to see uh, uh, that uh, folks, it says in a new uh, survey by YouGov, nearly three-quarters, 74% of American adults still view home ownership as a top harm hallmark of achieving the so-called American dream, beating out the ability to retire 66%, a successful career 60%, and having children 40%. Only 35% of respondents named obtaining a college degree as a key sign of economic success. Specifically among millennials, 65% identified home ownership as a top sign of success. That number fell to 59% for Gen Zers, Still a large figure and neck and neck with that generation's top choice of having a successful career. And they found that um, among the non-homeowners, nearly two-thirds said affordability was the main reason they hadn't yet purchased a home. Gen Zers largely said their income wasn't high enough, yet while millennials primarily blamed the rising home prices. Either way, the sentiment is clear. Most people would be buying homes if they could afford it. But, of course, this economy is rigged for the benefit of the oligarchs, people like the Black Rocks of the world, the vanguards, the Federal Reserve System, the folks who own these banks and media conglomerates that are always selling you onto impoverishing you for their special interests. Um, and, and that's what they're going to continue to do, and they're going to continue to make it more and more difficult for you ever to own a home until you wake up. And, I, and I'm disappointed because I, I would hope – that people would have been pushed around not enough with inflation being obscenely high, with 
their savings being robbed, with homes being denied from them, from so many problems, garbage medicine being foisted on them. You would think people like a 50 Anthony Sabatini type people would be sweeping into the house right now. And we don't see that. And that's a shame on the American people for being ignorant of 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 the stakes of what's at stake right now. It, I'm not even a person who believes very much in politics being the main primary engine of change and focus, right? You know me. But at the same time, if you're going to do it, do it well. Don't do it stupid. You know, don't keep doing the same dumb, idiotic thing of electing people who would do nothing to actually liberate you from the bondage of this oppressive, predatorial, crapless system. Okay? You know, none of these fake Republicans are going to do anything to make housing more affordable. None of them are going to stop the Ukraine meddling. How many of them are going to talk about what's going on where Europe is having this artificial energy crisis foisted upon them and food crisis, this whole thing? It's a total disgusting assault, criminal assault on good people in Europe and around the world. And these people won't even talk about it. You know, they won't even say anything about it. You don't hear anybody with, and and the ones who do run, you know, these these Republican primary voters are sleepy and dumb and apathetic. They don't want to do anything, apparently. You know, and and I'm I'm disappointed with that because it's like, what what level of tyranny do you need before you get out of your, your comfort zone, start using your brain, Use some passion and do something in terms of supporting people who actually take the fight against the tyrants politically. I, I think it's it's a telling thing that people want to continue to just take the blue pill or whatever you want to call it, check out, vote for their little red team or blue team, and not actually do the quality work of supporting people who are actually committed, passionate believers in principles. It's one of those things that it's it's telling that people will get the government that they deserve, you know? And I think it's something that it, it, it's, it's not becoming of a nation that says it's the place for freedom if there's not a more, uh, not more passion for actually getting principled people versus, you know, just showing up for whatever the generic establishment pick candidate will be uh, when you're not active in the uh, primary system. Uh, Here's a story in Zero Hedge, a dangerous escalation. A majority of Americans think Biden's speech was designed to incite conflict. 58 or 56.8 percent of Americans think Biden's declaration of war on Trump voters was a dangerous escalation in rhetoric which was designed to incite conflict among Americans, according to a new poll by Trafalgar Group. Perhaps even more telling is that 71% of Democrats said Biden's speech, in which he said MAGA forces pose a clear and present danger to democracy, thought it was simply accepting acceptable campaign messages, messaging, excuse me, thought it was simply, quote, acceptable campaign messaging that is to be expected in an election year. What should worry Democrats is that 62% of independent voters agreed with 89.1% of Republicans who said the speech was a dangerous escalation. This from the president who campaigned on uniting America against hatred. So, it looks like, again, more of the fallout from that stupid stunt is backlash against these uh, uh, audac- the audacity of these folks. It, the whole power gimmick thing, it's phony and it's embarrassing. You know, you could say one angle of that would be to try to trigger some dumb person to be violent uh, as a response to the obvious ploy of, uh, you know, chest beating and, and pounding the tables and so forth like Biden was trying to do uh, with the red uh, dark speech, um, you know, the, trying to trigger somebody to feel like, oh, my goodness, this is a tyranny. i got to go do something violent. Uh, but I, I think that even that is it's so obvious that it's just cartoonish and stupid and lame and pathetic and, and mealy mouth. And people are just sick of it. They see through the phoniness. Uh, I just wish they would see through it and then actually act on principle to actually bring in people, if you're going to do politics, 
that would actually do it with principles and with a real determination to get to the facts. You know, I don't want to hear about these general platitudes. They always say it over and over again. And there's only just a handful of people in D.C. to this day that say anything close to the truth of where we are in this moment on the economy, on the pandemic lies, on so many different things. It's just so hard to find a single soul in D.C. who will actually have the people's back. And, you know, I can only hope that the Democrats will start to finally peel away their corporatist wing and start to actually elect people who will challenge the corporatocracy as well. When I see people like uh, Jimmy Dore, you know, the comedian on the left, progressive comedian goes on uh, Tucker Carlson and takes it to the uniparty system. I think there's millions and millions of Democrats and progressives who are represented by someone like a Jimmy Dore. But why are they not translating that into political representation at the state and federal level? I mean, you know, progressives should be joining the uh, liberty folks on the right and opposing these pandemic overreaches and making sure they never do this again. Making sure this is never allowed again to do this kind of obscenity against people's lives and harming people, putting people in the most torturous situations medically just because of blind, stupid groupthink or corrupt, cynical things. You know, there's various motives for this type of ugly behavior, but it's all reprehensible. Uh, you know, this, this is something that we should see a transcendent moment where left and right come together. And I hope and pray that that's what we will see as we continue. Because ultimately, folks, we have to unite. But we're not going to unite around a scapegoat. We're going to unite around rolling up our sleeves, seeing each other as allies. Even if we don't agree on a lot of things, we can come together and oppose obvious tyranny. We can oppose ugly wars. We can oppose ugly central banks that are impoverishing us, making you work uh, half the year or more just to pay taxes and uh, inflation tax, making you have to pay more for the same goods because they're robbing your dollar every time it sits in the bank and they print more money of that dollar. Uh, that's the kind of thing that we all should unite around. And we cannot allow these political figures to divide us so that we are easy pickings. We need to unite together around our common dignity, on our love of liberty, on our desire to have safe uh, communities, vibrant communities, communities where you can start a business without being destroyed economically because of the rigged regulations. We need to have an economy where you can actually get on with your life without having to be bogged down by inflation and onerous taxation systems designed for the super wealthy billionaire class to benefit. We need to have a society where people can come together and say, you know what, I don't care what you like, Trump or not, I want to help you and I together work together to solve cancer, not politicians using our brain to find the science and to elevate it into the public consciousness. That's what I do on my show. So let's cure cancer, let's cure diabetes, let's cure heart disease, let's cure all these different afflictions that hold us back as the signs and wonders of how the world should be when we unite together and spread the kingdom of heaven on earth. I'm David Gronoski. Email me hello at a neighbor's choice.com. Godspeed.